Uh, Kia ora uh, Evan's my name. Um, you'll be aware that uh, last week, I think it was, um, Regenerate launched a new engagement um, episode with regard to the future use of the red zone lands along the Aiden Otaku corridor. Uh, involved in that, there's something like 2,000 pages of documentation which you can read if you wish, but rather than get stuck into that, I thought we might want to do a, a, have a bit of a summary overview of things beforehand so you, you got a good introduction to that. Um, so tonight we've invited Ivan and, and Rob along from um, Regenerate to, to present that to us. Uh, good evening everyone. Can people hear me okay at the back? Great. Uh, so I was actually just reflecting on one of the first conversations that we had probably around about a year ago or maybe a little over a year ago. Uh, when I first came along, having been appointed Chief Executive at Regenerate Christchurch. And at that stage, uh, I had a staff count of one, uh, and supported by an interim team. And the conversation at that stage that we had and that you shared with me were around your experiences of the recovery to date, and the expectations that you had of an organisation that had been established to consider some pretty big questions that we still had in front of us as a city. And some of the things that I took away from that conversation were around people wanting an understanding of how we were going to go about developing regeneration plans that would inform and make decisions about some of the key areas of our city. So how were we going to go about developing these regeneration plans? You told me that you wanted to understand where the decision points were and who the decision makers would be and how we would go about developing an approach that provided for meaningful community input, engagement and discussion, and where those opportunities would be. Uh, and since the beginning of this year, what we've been uh, delivering against is an outline that we published for public feedback that gave you an opportunity to help shape and guide the approach that we're taking to developing the regeneration plan. And so, what I thought I would start with in terms of the conversation tonight is a very brief overview of the journey to date uh, because it, it's all part of where we've come from, where we're currently at and kind of what the next steps look like. Uh, and then I'll ask Rob to take you through the 10 land use options that have been published. And when I came last time to talk to you, which was I think the second time, so this might be the, probably the third conversation that we'd had, at that point, there was a kind of a standing line that no decisions had been made about the red zone, about the future of the red zone. Uh, and now we are starting to make decisions. Um, we are at the early stages of making those decisions. And the information that we've published and the feedback that you give will help to shape the next stage of decision making, which will lead to a short list of three overall options for the red zone ahead of a large public exhibition. Uh, so just in terms of context, uh, and a, a reminder, I guess, of the scale of the area that we're talking about, but also the unique opportunity that we have. So we're talking about an area that does include the former residential red zone, but it's actually broader than that. So the feedback that we had from our strategic partners and also from members of the public when we published the outline last year was that people said to us that they'd like us to consider including other publicly owned land adjacent to the residential red zone. And so the 602 hectares, which is the regeneration area that we're referring to, includes the residential red zone, but it also includes some publicly owned land. So for example, uh, uh, Avonside Girls High, Porrot Park, and a number of other uh, publicly owned uh, areas as well. As we all know, uh, it has areas adjacent to the Avon River. The river kind of provides the central backbone or the spine of, of this area. And when we came in, talked with you probably around about September of last year. About that time we'd published a lot of existing technical information about the residential red zone because access to information you said was a key, uh, was a key matter for communities to have access to. So ease of access to information in one place, understandable. So one of the first things that we did was we collated a whole lot of technical information that currently existed we created an, an online platform where you could go and look at that and, and overlay the information. And that wasn't intended to be the answer, that was the starting point, which would help to inform further questions that we would ask. And so, uh, 
kind of where we've come from, what we thought we'd, we'd cover off tonight is, is the overall process, the land use assessments, the 10 combinations, so what are they, how have we derived them, uh, and then talking about uh, the opportunity for feedback and what the next steps are. So how does the feedback inform the decisions and how will it be considered? Um, you won't be able to see this from the back and I'm not expecting you to, and we have hard copies of the information. It's information that's on our website. But I guess just in terms of where we're currently at. So one of the things that we had feedback from the community on when we were initially looking at this area was whether we should look at segments of this area or whether we should look at the area as a whole. And the overwhelming feedback was that the area should be considered as a whole, the river as a system, without considering it as a whole, there isn't the opportunity to consider the benefits and the trade-offs and the opportunity costs and look at how we might create an overarching vision for this area that the whole area itself can contribute to. There were a number of ideas and proposals that were already in the public domain, but the missing question at that point was to achieve what? What was the purpose of this area? What was the contribution of it to the, the future of our city and potentially to New Zealand as a, as a country? So we started uh, having collated a lot of technical information and made that publicly available, uh, asking people for thoughts and ideas about the contribution this area could make. And we held a large public event uh, out at Hayata Community Campus. Uh, we had several hundred, hundred people coming through, sharing their ideas and their thoughts and suggestions, proposals for the contribution that this area could make. And off the back of that, we started to create a vision for this area, a narrative that articulated the role that this area would play in the future of, of Christchurch. And we created a draft vision for the area. We published it for feedback. We had feedback from the public, uh, not surprising. Uh, and off the back of that public feedback, we refined or evolved that vision to take on board and, and consider the feedback that we had received. And that vision was published earlier, uh, earlier this year. And that was uh, based on a number of, as I said, ideas, proposals, and suggestions. To date, we've received over 5,000. We had the visioning phase which identified the vision and also off the back of that some objectives. So how, would, how do we articulate what it is that we are seeking to achieve within this area? How do we start to distill down to some more tangible outcomes that people can grasp hold of and that we can assess various land uses against uh, either individually or in terms of combinations? So that's, that work's been completed and now we're starting to get into the design phase. And so as you can see, some decisions are starting to be made, but it's early in the design process and we're wanting to make sure that people have an opportunity to provide feedback ahead of the next key decision being made. So just to recap, this was the, the shared vision. So this was the vision that was co-created. It took on board feedback from the community. We then published the vision uh, and it really talks about the opportunity that this area provides for us to connect with each other, with nature and new possibilities. Off the back of that, we developed some, some objectives for Christchurch and also for New Zealand. Now the themes that came through in terms of the ideas, suggestions, proposals and the feedback on the vision really emphasised four key things. One was around connection. So the opportunity for this area to connect people together through various land uses and activities from all different communities, communities of interest, communities of place, communities of identity, but also to connect with nature and with other opportunities. Uh, water's a pretty important thing to people in Christchurch, no surprise. Uh, and given what had happened in this area, the opportunity that this area provides for us to improve uh, the water, the land, the, the ecology of this, the area around it, 602 hectares does provide quite a significant opportunity to think about how this area can contribute to better ecological and environment, environmental outcomes. Uh, and opportunities, and this came through particularly strong from people in East Christchurch, for employment and an economic contribution, not only to the area, but to the city as well. And then looking at how this might contribute to broader benefits for New Zealand, the opportunities that we have here in Christchurch to demonstrate how you might uh, use in an urban environment an area that is exposed to multiple hazards, sea level rise, uh, liquefaction, lateral spread, uh, coastal inundation in a sort of marine and fresh water environment. It's a challenge that most cities in the world are facing and in respecting the past and what we've been through, 
how might this area be used as an opportunity to learn from the past, to trial new ways of living with and, and adapting to some of the natural hazards, uh, but also creating something that the rest of the world can learn from and that we can contribute, uh, having been through the disaster and the things that we've learned, what are the positive opportunities that we could look for out of that. So that was the, the, those were the vision and objective statements that we uh, developed for the area collectively. We've also developed a land use assessment. I'm going to ask Rob to talk to the land use assessment and then the land use options. Can you still hear me down the back with the refrigerator? Um, before I get into that conversation, there's a, a couple of things that I want to acknowledge. There are uses that are technically feasible within the residential red zone that we should consider sensitively and respectfully. And included amongst those are decisions around whether or not things, opportunities and uses like residential development are possible and should even be considered. So this is an area that housed many thousands of people, homes, communities and families. And none of the work that we have done to date is deciding that residential development should occur in these areas. What we've done is, is work to understand potentially where it might be possible. And that work suggests that there are some areas where we might want to consider some further investigation and analysis to determine the type, nature and model of housing that, that could be considered. But the discussion around housing and whether or not housing should be reintroduced within the residential red zone is a, discuss a discussion that started the moment the first residential decision was made. It was one of the first questions that was asked and it's been a live question for the community for about the last six and a half years. So it is very much a conversation and a question that has been asked and considered predominantly within the community over the last six and a half years. It is a conversation and a debate that we need to have and it's a debate that we're not having in our office behind closed doors. The intention of this is to put some information into the domain and to encourage a public debate because there will be a range of views and all of those views should be considered. But there are other uses as well that we are proposing that people will also find uh, challenging in terms of what it is that's being proposed. And I want to acknowledge that up front because many of us will either know people who have lived in the residential red zone. Some of you here tonight may have lived in the residential red zone. I've been here before and spoken and had conversations when there are people, uh, with people who are still living in the residential red zone. And so the conversation that we're looking to have is with the utmost respect uh, and wanting to have that in the most respectful way. And so I'll ask Rob now to talk through the land use assessments and the options that we have published. Uh, and then we'll talk about next steps and then we can get into a, a discussion uh, about the, the merits and the wife wars and those sorts of matters. Does that sound okay? All right. Rob. Cool. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Rob Kerr. I'm um, wet for Ivan, uh, looking after the residential red zone team uh, for Regenerate Christchurch. So, uh, James, Paul, you guys are pretty deaf, so if you can't hear me, let me know, okay? So, uh, what I'm going to do is run through uh, a brief overview of each of the different, or well, the, the, the some of the different land use assessments that we've done, which is helping inform then the 10 combinations of, of land uses that we published the other day. So uh, I'll do that relatively briefly and at a high level, um, but uh, as I think Ivan mentioned, there's, behind this there's 2,000 pages of, of, of studies and, and, and reports and so on, and, and look, Ivan's read them, I've read them, I think it's only right that you guys read them as well. <laughs> so I, pre I appreciate for all the effort that you're going to put into this. Um, however, if perhaps you don't have all that time, there's quite a lot of summary information on our website. Um, sort of there's the, uh, we talk about, you know, 30 seconds, three minutes, and um, I think the rest of your life is, is, the, is the next layer. Um, and so I really invite you to have a look at those. So there's some quite good summaries um, done on each of the different land uses, and you can delve as deep as, into them as, as you want to, individually or, or, or all of them. So I invite you to do that. But I'll go over them briefly now, and we'll see how we go, and then... Uh, and, and then obviously we have questions to, to have to get at any of them, else at them later. So, first of them, and, and the screen's far too small to be able to read for, for, for most of you, including me, but there's 12 different land use types. 
So what we've done, we've taken the five odd thousand ideas um, and we've, we've filtered those through into themes and categories and so on to really understand um, how we can uh, chunk them up a bit. Um, and so we can start to look at a land use uh, plan uh, and, uh, and, and really start to ha how that expresses itself. So we've chunked them up into, into these 12 land uses. So I'll just read them out, um, just so you get an idea of what they are. So we've got productive land uses, uh, which is agriculture, primary production, uh, and community gardens and so on. We've got community places and spaces, so that's a, a r long, r large range of places for the way people gather together. Uh, ecological restoration, I think that says uh, what it is. Uh, but there's many shades of that, of course, and many different ways to do it. There's the residential uh, land use assessment, which, uh, which I haven't referred to before. There's also recreation uh, of, of different sp uh, sorts. Transport, what are the different transport improvements and options and opportunities within the, within the river corridor, as well as connecting the river corridor to e everything else. Uh, visitor attractions, which I'll talk a little bit about more shortly. Uh, flood mitigation, which is an important part of, of thinking about this long-term use of this land. Uh, economic activity, flat water sports, white water sports, and water quality improvement. Uh, so so they're the, they the 12 different land use types. There's a different set of reports and technical studies on each of those as well. So if we take a, a closer look at, uh, at a few of them. So ecological uh, restoration land use assessment. It looks through quite a different range of different types of and approaches that could be, could be taken to, to ecological uh, restoration. There's some, uh, there's some key principles in there, and I won't read those out. There's quite a lot of principles. And there, there, it looks at the different types of scale. So from what small uh, ec bits of ecological restoration can do to very, very large bits to, um, to uh, eco-centuries with predator-proof fences to, to different patches to, to make sure we get those, um, the impacts that, that we may wish for. And, and, and trying to weigh up the costs and benefits of each of those uh, uh, different options. So the residential land use assessment. So uh, behind this there's a, there's a thick piece of um, development feasibility assessment which looks at, okay, so and, and definitely building on what, what Ivan was saying, if, if we were of a mind to, if it was the right thing to do, what, how could you do it? How could you engineer it? Should, uh, it doesn't ask the question, should you? It does, if, if we're going to, should, uh, how, how would we do it? And so it looks at those engineering, looks at those costs, and looks at the value created at the end of that to see if it's financially feasible. And you know, some of those areas, it is now financially feasible, as long as you do it on, those, on that bulk scale. Uh, but also looks at, so what are the other sorts of housing uh, away from those traditional suburban uh, subdivision style developments that we do uh, around the city? What are the adaptable or more resilient housing types that we may be able to look at? And this particularly goes to that um, objective uh, that's in our, in our seven objectives around demonstrating how uh, we could show how uh, we could adapt to climate change, to sea level rise, to other natural hazards. And perhaps there's an opportunity to explore uh, and test some things um, from there. Uh, there's also uh, an idea in there uh, which we've uh, had discussions with with the Avondale and Rafiti Golf Clubs about the idea of a land swap uh, and, and reuse of uh, those existing golf clubs. And I think that's a live um, debate that we should have as a community as well. So Avondale was included? In yep. The yep. Uh, the visitor attraction land use assessment. There's a really interesting piece of, piece of work done uh, looking at the visitor projections. Uh, for what this, as an de overall destination, the 602, the four times Hagley Park destination can, can draw in. So it's forecasting around about 4 million visits a year, about a million individual uh, unique visitors, 1.3 million tickets for ticketed attractions uh, that, it could that it could bring in. So if you think about that in terms of that scale, that number of visitors coming to East Christchurch that wouldn't have come here before, that's a substantial change for in, in, in terms of opportunity, in terms of economic opportunity for New Brighton, for people living there and uh, around there, in terms of vibrancy, in terms of employment and so on. So it's predicting some, some, some really interesting numbers which, which can make some real differences. So, and that's really talking about its advantages of scale, but we need to think about as part of all this conservation conversation is, is what's the, why, why do people want it, what will bring people in? 
what's the what's the theme? What's the what's the what's the destination or qualities that we should bring in? Is this about is it about food? Is it about play? Or about uh, what is it uh, ecological? Or is it about all of those? And what's the right mix? And what's the right emphasis? And so part of those these ten options is exploring that uh, that balance of emphasis as well. So the flood risk land use assessment really builds on a lot of work that's already been done by the Christchurch City Council um, in terms of what, looking at all the different flood risk uh, options for, for mitigating that flood risk. The flood risk here in those, these lower reaches, and, and I see Ken's here, he can probably talk to this better than I can, um, the, uh, is really based on, on, on due, to this, due to the tidal uh, influence coming in from the estuary. So although there's a, um, a, an enormous catchment coming down the river, really the most of the flood risk in these lower reaches of the Avon is caused uh, and created and, and, and controlled by the tidal, uh, the tidal height. So that's going to get worse as sea level rises as well. So what are our options for dealing with that? So it concludes the same as the, uh, as the City Council work that, that fundamentally stop banking uh, will be the most uh, effective way, cost efficient, but actually the most effective way of mitigating flood risk as well. Uh, so then the question is, so what is the alignment of those stop banks and how can it fit in with all the other different types of land uses and, 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 and so on. So, and what's the phasing and what's the rollout about how that all can work together. There is uh, a, a flat water, water sports course uh, land use assessment, or indicative business case actually is what it is. There's a substantial technical feasibility study done looking at every possible configuration of range of options are through the whole area, around about 30 I think it got up to, uh, different configurations and land uses of, of a lake of different sizes, of different purposes and so on. So there's a lot of information in there about uh, technically how you, how you how you could do it and what you need to do and of course how much it costs. So, um, and, and all the other issues and challenges and, and solutions to those issues and challenges uh, to, to make it technically feasible. There is also a indicative business case which explores the drivers for why and what you get out and the values um, of, a, of a flat water facility. So that's uh, quite a lot of work has gone into that and it's a really important part of the conversation as well. I think this might be the final one that I talked to in terms of this, this round um, about a water quality land use assessment. So that focuses primarily on uh, storm water quality. So around about 2,500 hectares of, of Christchurch, of the urban area of Christchurch, drains through the residential red zone, through the Aden River Corridor. So there's obviously a, a large area further upstream, which includes the central city, which includes uh, Addington and Rickerton and so on, which is draining into, into the river, which is washing contaminants and so on into the river. But there's 2,500 hectares draining through uh, there. So there is a substantial opportunity to improve that uh, stormwater quality before it uh, enters the river and therefore help protect the river and, and, and help make it thrive more. So uh, that explores that. There's some uh, plans in there which is looking at the potential locations and sizes and extents of, of wetlands and, and detention basins, which would help improve that water quality. Okay, so in the 10 combinations uh, of land uses that we put forward, um, there are a lot of these land uses I've just talked about, or a number of these land uses I've just talked about, and a lot of the ideas that come, have come through of the 5,000 ideas, uh, uh, we're, we're saying that we can do it with any of these options. And so these become our common elements. And so there's a list there which some of you might be able to read. There's, a, there's, a, there's room for community places and spaces for transport improvements, for flood mitigation, for recreation of different sorts, for water quality improvements, and for ecological restoration. And that's mainly in, in this area here that is described in this map. And if you've got one of these, when you open up up here, it's that this map at the top. So this is where, for a, for a number of reasons, but the simplest one to talk about, oh, cheers, mate. The simplest one to talk about is we've, we, we all saw what happens close to the river when we have an earthquake and we get that really severe lateral spread, those big cracks that open up. And we're, we're suggesting perhaps it's not that wise to, to build anything in that area and perhaps keep it as open space. And I, normally when I say that, nobody really complains about it. So in, in, in keeping with that, that, that means we, we, we think about a, perhaps up to 150 metres wide, but it varies, it can vary, um, corridor either side of the river. 
and that's what that, uh, that this plan here is providing. Um, if it's 150 metres wide both sides, 10 and a half kilometres long, that's around about 300 hectares. So that's half the total of 600 hectares. That's twice the size of Hagley Park. It's a substantial area of which there is a lot of room to do a lot of things. And I think the obvious things when we think about these are uh, a city to sea trail and walking paths, but also there's opportunity for small things like, um, you know, let's face it, there's got to be the cafe with the wine and the beer and things like that, but also perhaps some just spaces that, that different groups take stewardship over and whether they, they, they do it to, um, uh, to play bowls or they do it to, um, to, for ecological restoration or, or all sorts of different things. There's so many different opportunities. Perhaps, Blair, there might be a dog park, who knows. So, um, so there's all those... Yeah, okay. And there might be some of those too. So there's plenty of opportunity, and I think that's, that's something we can work through over the years to come, because we don't have to make all these decisions all in one go. So these are, these are what we think is the common element for all these options. And then we talk about... Actually, if you go back... Sorry, sorry, sorry if you can go back uh, one. So there are here... Then when we, we look outside the green corridor there... There are a number of areas, a number of large areas, which, um, if you like, provide us with some options. And then the, the discussion should be, okay, so, so what, how do we use that land for its best impact to meeting those, that vision and those objectives and, and making the largest contribution it can make to the future of our city? So there are a variety of options. And what I'm going to go through is, is the permutations of, of, a, of five particular land use types that will make up those, uh, those options. So the other land use types were seen as those within those common elements. So the other, the other five are, are, are different, different combinations or emphasis of residential, <coughs> productive land uses, <coughs> recreation, including flat water facilities. My mind's gonna go now, visitor attractions, and ecological restoration. Thank you, thank God somebody's reading, um, reading it for me. So, um, so it's really different combinations and different permutations and, and degrees of emphasis on all of those. So if we, if we start going through those now. So the first one, and you'll see these build and change over time, so I'll go through them reasonably quickly because of course you can, I really encourage you to take the time to, um, to study these and, and get your head around because there's, there's, there is, despite its sim relative looking simplicity, there's quite a bit of uh, thinking and detail behind these. Um, uh, but this one starts off with all eco ecological restoration. So including uh, the things that I talked about before in terms of the common elements, but actually all those um, areas that are outside the river, uh, the, 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 the open space corridor, as ecological restoration as well. And there's, of course, different shades of that green, but there is uh, and a variety of ways to do it. Then this option introduces visitor attractions. Uh, ticketed and unticketed visitor attractions to start talking about this place as, 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 as further enhancing it as a, as a destination. And so there are plenty of ideas and proposals and, and discussions going on um, far and wide in terms of what that could be from, from whitewater sports to, to, to Eden projects and to many other different types of visitor attractions. This one builds on that and introduces a 2.2 kilometre out of river lake. So you'll see that there's a variety of large water body options through these. So this one is, is uh, an out of river lake uh, just beside uh, Kerr's Reach. This is the, uh, a further variation on that. This is a 2.2 kilometre long uh, water course or lake that is in the river. Uh, uh, if you like, a wider and, and enhanced Kerr's Reach again with the ecological restoration and the visitor attractions there as well. This one is a, is a, is a new variation which has the ecological restoration and adding in the, those purple areas where, uh, which is a, a potential residential area. So there are the areas where we've identified outside the river, the, the, the green open space corridor, which uh, could be financially feasible for residential development sometime in the future. It also includes the Rafiti golf course and Avondale golf course land swap for a new golf course in Bexley as well. This is a variation on that which adds in an additional layer of uh, ticketed and non-ticketed visitor attractions.
This uh, option includes a, a shorter lake, 1.1 kilometre long watercourse, uh, with ecological restoration and residential options there as well. And again, you'll see it includes the, the land swap with the, with the golf courses. Then a further variation on that, adding in the visitor attractions as well. So I'm hoping you're starting to see the pattern of the different permutations and degrees of, of, of emphasis within each one. This one uh, includes productive land uses. So the productive land uses, uh, there's a variety of different possibilities here. This is, um, we've had some really interesting work done by an agribusiness consultant to, to look at the soils, what the capacity is, and so on. Um, really interesting things about almonds, manuka honey, and all those bits and pieces, and berries. Um, and, and looking at, so what, is, what, are, what, can, what the soils can hold, and then also what are the other opportunities. So perhaps further downstream, there might be aquaculture types of opportunities, and further upstream where the land is drier, other different sorts of uh, horticulture. Uh, but also bringing in visitor attractions and ecological enhancement into that as well. This one builds on that and adds in the, just double check, yes it does, uh, further uh, visitor attractions as well. And those, again, ticketed and non-ticketed. So we're not being specific about what those visitor attractions could be, um, though we have in the land use assessment report behind this uh, a range of potential ones that, that appear to be um, appropriate and, 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 and suitable and, and perhaps likely to be financially feasible as well. So the other 10, so I really encourage you to have a bit of a, bit of a look at this um, and, and get your head around it. I better hold it up the right way. Um, obviously we were happy to talk about this and, and, and I'm sure there'll be plenty of other discussions uh, that we should all have about this. Because of this, uh, we just go to those visitor attraction numbers, the, the difference that it can make to people's lives in terms of employment, in terms of opportunity on that east side of town could be very, very significant. Uh, what it does for Christchurch in terms of level of perception, uh, what it does in terms of the health and well-being in terms of the ecological restoration. All these things are really, really important questions we should ask for ourselves and we should ask ourselves about what's the right emphasis. Then as, as we go on, it's not a conversation for now, but it's a conversation for perhaps early next year about um, what's, the, what, what's the value proposition? You know, who, who should be paying for this? How do we fund it? Now, over what sort of time period should we fund it? These are the other questions that we should be asked. But that's for later. Now we're asking these questions, and, and through our website particularly, you know, have we missed anything? Done a lot of this work. This is sort of the direction that we're starting to head, but before we head too much further, we want to check in to say, have we missed anything? Anything else we should consider? Any, uh, any, any uh, new ideas, any, any red flags. And so that's, uh, that's what this, this part of this, uh, this conversation should be about. Thanks. Evan. Thanks very much.